Kesho. Kesho. Pata pambazuka tu. Ndio ile kesi yangu. Na mimi na mashahidi. Mashahidi wote wamekataa. Wote wamekataa. Hadi wale wanaojua shauli langu vizuri. Na pia wamekataa. Wote hao wamekataa kwa sababu wanaogopa. Najiuliza. Wanaogopa nini? inavosemekana wanagupa wa polisi wanagupa wale watu wanavaa majoho na mawingi meupe wanagupa kile chumba cha mahakama na ile matabu yao makubwa makubwa wanahisi Na wote ingizo atiani. Nimeenda kwa mjumbe wangu. Kana mbeni tafuti wakili. Najiuliza. Uyu wakili ni nani? wakili hata nisaidiaje mimi simjui anijui na wao hafahamu lolote juu ya shauri langu anategemea maelezo kutoka kwenye midomo yangu si nimekwisha mimi na mara <laughs> Mshtakiwa wangu ana pesa. Anaweza kumlipa wakili hata kununua mashahidi. katika shauli langu ni muone mjumbe ni muone jirani na jamii nzima inayonizunguka ikishirikiana kutoa uamuzi juu ya shauli langu ah ezizi Jamii shilikishwa katika kutoa muzi. Na hapa kwa na mapolisi. Wala wala wanavaa majoho na mawingi meupe hawakuepo. Hata vile vitabu vyao vikubwa vikubwa vile havikuepo lakini haki ilitendeka. Na kila mtu alilizika na uamuzi. Kwa kusema hivi Simaanishi kwamba mahakama ya sasa haitoi haki bali itafanya vizuri zaidi kama ikishirikiana na mfumo wa zamani wa kutoa haki
Nadia, eh. Tumpe mani mwenye kiti. Tumpe mani mwenye kiti. Nadia, eh. Tumpe mani mwenye kiti. Tumpe mani mwenye kiti. Nadia, eh. Tumpe mani mwenye kiti. Tumpe mani kiti. poem is Kaliakiti, Swahili for assuming the chair. I won't tell you about lady, sister, na mama. I won't tell you about her carefully bronze etched lament. For she does not cry, neither does she wail nor scream. Instead, she enters a state of visionary illumination, casting her eyes back in times. She mourns that claimed sense of solidity. Then she gazes heavily at despised multiple crimes committed by you and you, me, he, she. Barbarous acts, physical, mental, spiritual, streamed live, looped without constraint. They have left lacerations, deeply cut fault lines, embedded into the cellular understanding of what we think we know. And yet, with such an overwhelming case to answer, see, she sees channels where once oozing red wounds were present. She sees an embrace where once there was disfigurement. She is the ode to lives to be lived. Do we not recall the majesty of Mount Kilimanjaro? Its might. Was it not the divine produce strained out of contorted earthly fault lines? And yet today, it stands upright, connected, omniscient, and neutrally just. You see, our destiny is how we perceive it to be. 
Our reality is how we imagine it, brought into existence by a new kind of toil, unshackled this time around. A graft effervescently fresh, a determination laced with purpose, co-joined by voices of peoples across vast lands, Azania, peoples with the inalienable right to tell their stories in pictures, vibrant songs, and in true color that hovers across your minds. And at that approaching moment, our eyes, your eyes shall be open. To see that lady, the one I won't tell you about, the sister Namama, for she has foretold and bears witness to a new force that shall assume that chair, that station of responsibility, that seat of consciousness, connection, and of justice. I won't tell you about lady, sister, na mama. Thank you. Order. The court is now in session. I call on the matter of the ALN Academy Africa on Trial series, the prosecution of East Africa. All rise for the presiding judge. His Honor, Judge Mohammed Chande Otman, the former Chief Justice of the United Republic of Tanzania. Your Lordship. Ladies and gentlemen, the trial that is about to deliberate before us involves the prosecution of East Africa, rep representing allegations of utmost seriousness and the overall charge levied against the region by the prosecution is that it has acted, that is East Africa has acted or failed to act in a manner that has rendered the rule of law in the sub-region non-existent. For the prosecution you have on my right, Aisha Abdallah of counsel and partner at Anjarwala in Kana, Nairobi, Kenya. And for the defense on my left, we have retired Lady Justice Joyce Aluch, former judge of the Court of Appeal of Kenya and former vice president of the ICC uh, here in The Hague. Both parties have submitted their full written submissions and therefore I will ask both of them to be very brief, in fact very brief, in this oral final submission understanding that all what they have raised in submissions will be taken into account uh, during deliberations and in the judgment that is to follow. After the parties have made their submissions, I will adjourn this matter for about one and a half hours to deliberate and issue the judgment, pronounce the judgment at 7 p.m. here, and I invite you all, I invite you all to attend and to engage in, a pre, in the interactive discussion after that, I now call upon Aisha Abdallah for the prosecution to present her final oral submissions. Counsel. Thank you, Your Lordship. Good, good afternoon. The prosecution has submitted detailed written submissions showing that 
the East African region is failing in key aspects of the rule of law. Given the limited time available to me today, I will focus on three key features, which I think you will agree have, if we prove our case on the evidence provided, will show that there is no rule of law in our region. Starting first with order and security. This is a fundamental aspect of rule of law without which no other fundamental rights and freedoms can be enjoyed. It is the very basis and foundation of the development of a fair and sustainable society. Sadly, it is lacking in our region. We turn our attention firstly to Burundi. Between 1993 and 2005, there was a 10-year civil war which caused 300,000 civilians to lose their lives. In 2015, following a brief period of stability, the incumbent president announced that he would be seeking to extend his term and vie for office again. This led to mass street protests, which are brutally cracked down upon by the police and the authorities. There was abduction and disappearance of opposition members. The African Union tried to step in and offered to provide a peacekeeping force to restore order and security. But the Burundian government announced that the African Union peacekeeping force was not welcome. UNHCR report states that 350,000 Burundian refugees are sheltering in neighboring countries and that the conflict has paralyzed entire sectors of the economy, including small and medium enterprises, depriving people of their livelihoods. But this is not all. If we turn to South Sudan, which gained its independence only recently in 2011, unfortunately, two years later, it was plunged into civil war. This led to many people losing their lives and millions being displaced. UNHCR's report, published recently in March of this year, states that 2.288 million people are asylum seekers from South Sudan. The Norwegian Refugee Council has calculated the impact of the conflict on the economy of South Sudan. There is soaring inflation and food price rises. This means that 70% of the families in South Sudan will be affected by famine. Human Rights Watch has looked at the impact on infrastructure. This has been destroyed by the war. Further, government forces have attacked civilians in opposition-held territories. There have been at least 120 reported cases of rapes, and there's not been a single prosecution. The next charge is a failure to hold governments to account and to restrict the, in particular, exercise of executive powers. Here we look at Uganda. Recently, in December 2018, the Ugandan parliament passed a law to remove the presidential age limit of 75 years. This was deliberately designed to allow President Museveni to stand for another term of office in 2021. Again, this led to protests by opposition members of parliament, led by Bobby Wine. He was arrested and detained, and he was held at a military holding center without trial. The Ugandan authorities also arrested Dr. Stella Nyanzi, a leading academic and political activist. What was her charge? Alarming, annoying, and ridiculing the person of the president, a charge I would say is unknown to law. What did she do? She posted criticism of President Museveni on social media. The Ugandan High Court failed to live up to its standards to hold the executive to account. They denied Dr. Stella bail on numerous occasions and have failed to give her a speedy trial. So we can see in Uganda that neither the judiciary nor parliament is strong enough to stand up to the executive. Then we look at Rwanda, often touted as a good example of improvements on rule of law. What's happened here? In 2016, there was a referendum calling for an extension of the presidential term limit beyond the initial two terms. An overwhelming 98% of people who voted 
um, voted for the extension, but the opposition said that the process was neither transparent nor democratic. Further steps have been taken to stifle the opposition. Victoire Ingabire, who was the main contender against the president and de facto opposition leader, was arrested and detained on charges of genocide denial. She was imprisoned for eight years. Her trial was politically motivated, and the African Court of Human and People's Rights, in a decision made in November 2017, has said she was denied the right to fair trial. She was only released recently in September following a presidential pardon, again for politically motivated reasons. Diane Riguara was a presidential contender in 2017. She was arrested and detained. Both of these are politically motivated actions, and we see here a failure of the judiciary to hold the executive to account. The Rwandese parliament has 80 seats, only two of which are held by the opposition. So it's not surprising that the two opposition members are unable to exercise the checks and balances required. And now we turn to a very serious charge, which is the denial of access to justice in the region. We've already mentioned South Sudan, but there's a heavy toll that is being taken by the ongoing conflict. There's a complete breakdown in rule of law institutions. The population has no confidence in existing state institutions, and 80% are relying on customary dispute resolution mechanisms. Or they're taking justice into their own hands, which is resulting in further violence. We also have repeated violations of the human rights of women and girls. The United Nations reports that little has been done to curb this and that there is pervasive impunity. In Somalia, the UK's Home Office um, also focuses on sexual and gender-based violence. The main form this takes is female genital mutilation, which is 98% prevalent in the country. There are also widespread incidences of rape and domestic violence, and the stigmatization of victims compounds this, which means that the authorities are reluctant to investigate and prosecute. What does this leave the victims with? they turn to traditional dispute resolution mechanisms. But this, these mechanisms are inherently biased against them and lenient on perpetrators. In Kenya, we have a very forward-looking constitution which guarantees access to justice, but is failed to implement this. So civil justice, we have a huge backlog of cases caused by a lack of sufficient judicial officers. The recent State of the Judiciary Annual Report um, shows that the ratio of judges to the citizens is 1 to 340,000. It's not enough. If you do get to court, civil cases are taking at least three years, and there's a guaranteed right of at least one appeal in our Constitution. So the ultimate timeline is longer. When we come to criminal justice, we have uncertainty. Our Constitution guarantees the right to bail, but often you will find that this is denied. In practice, the Kenya police have a habit of detaining minor traffic offenders in order to intimidate them and extort bribes. Amnesty International has reported that the Kenya police are implicated in extrajudicial killings. In one report of 2016 to 2017, in one of our 47 counties, Mombasa, there were 78 killings alone committed by the police. That's one in 47. These are the people that are supposed to help us defend and enforce justice. The victims of these extrajudicial killings are the youth of who are based in slum areas. These are the very people who are traditionally denied access to justice. What is my conclusion? I think you'll agree with me that having shown and highlighted just a few examples of failings in rule of law, there's a lot of work to be done. And that despite having good laws on paper, it is not sufficient. East Africa must try and implement those laws and give real meaning to this fancy term of rule of law. I close my case. Okay. Yeah, it is time to hear counsel for the defendant. Thank you, um, 
my lord the judge. I'm making a very brief, uh, um, I have made detailed submissions in writing, now this is my summary, in defense of East Africa. The arguments used by the prosecution are the same ones supporting the defense case order and security. The allegation is that war, civil war hindering, uh, is hindering order and security. My submission is that civil war is a common phenomenon and not unique to East Africa. Look at the civil war in the United States. Um, whilst the, the civil war determined what kind of nation America would be, what about right here? In, in, in the Netherlands, the 80-year-old Dutch revolt. Then, uh, 80 years of war and the creation of the, the Netherlands. Some of you might remember, no taxation, no representation. That was the slogan. And I've given an example of several other wars, several other countries, several other wars. Time will not permit me to go through all that. Now, the prosecution have made substantive uh, submissions about South Sudan. Most of my submissions are in writing, but I will say that South Sudan, I'm submitting that South Sudan is slowly but surely recovering from civil war. Um, there was peace agreement in 2018, last year, between the government of South Sudan and the former rebel leader who then joined government. But over and above that, I believe that almost all of you read what happened sometimes this month. I think we are still in the month of April, and this is what happened in Rome. When, the Pope, when Pope Francis invited these two leaders that you can see, and very dramatically kissed their feet. It was completely dramatic. And that was, he urged them to form a, 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 a government of unity. And I sincerely hope that moving forward, these two leaders did get the message. And that is, um, they, they will move forward, I believe, for, uh, to maintain order and security in South Sudan. Now in Sudan, you all know that in April, April 11th this year, Omar Bashir stepped down dramatically. He stepped down after several weeks of street protests. Now, then the, the military council said that it will run the, two year, run the country for two years before elections, and the demonstrators took none of that. They continued. And last night, if you listen to the BBC, the latest in Sudan is that the military council and the opposition agreed to share power to decide on a negotiated um, government. They are doing this to bring order and security to, uh, to Sudan. Now, still in uh, East Africa, in Ethiopia, Ethiopia recently passed law that grants amnesty to politicians uh, political prisoners who have been released. And Burundi, so much has been submission from the uh, defense, from the prosecution about Burundi. But I want to say that um, Burundi is involved in uh, disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration program. It's a very active program and ongoing in that country. Now, it reduced the number of child soldiers children enjoying their fundamental human rights, and Burundi is doing this voluntarily to advance the rule of law, accountability. Allegation from the prosecution is that constrained governments are undermining the rule of law in East Africa. I want to submit that East Africa has open governments that advance the rule of law. The only reason that the prosecution has given, has been able to obtain the statistics that they have is because these numbers have been reported. It also shows government openness, which advances the rule of law. Uh, Uganda, 
so much submission has been made about uh, Uganda, the removal of, uh, of government, uh, the, the removal of age limit. Now, these were passed in parliament. And this, uh, these are popular votes, and I think the court subsequently confirmed. So if, if parliament was all right with it, and the court felt it was all right, then we have to see how to move forward. But over and above that, uh, government, by the way, cannot be accountable without opposition. Now, in Uganda, there, has been, there are two perennial rivals, the president himself and uh, Dr. Kazibe. But they met recently during Martyrs Day celebrations, and they have prom they have promised to work together, and we have to wait and see. They have met. Now, in Tanzania, there's a ban on foreign trips to, for public servants by the president. This has been welcomed because this was wasting public resources. Again, two senior politicians charged with sedition, incitement to violence, and holding and legal have been released on bail in Tanzania. Accountability. So much submission was made on accountability. Uh, uh, but as far as Rwanda is concerned, one thing that the prosecution did not tell you is the gender equality in Rwanda. Parliament is 39 male and female is 61. Government is 50-50. And uh, the two, um, Ingabire has been uh, released, uh, has been pardoned. She was, it was quoted by the, uh, by the prosecution, but she has been pardoned. She was released from jail, the, the, where she had, been, she had been jailed for 15 years in 2012. Um, Diana Re uh, Reguara was barred from running for presidential. She was in prison, but she too has been released. So Rwanda is slowly moving in the right direction. Access to justice. Allegation is that East Africa lacks, lacking is in access to justice, but I would submit that East Africa is making, making tremendous stride. Alternative dispute resolution. I think here Kenya is leading. A pilot project was started for court and ex mediation. After one year, this has become the norm now in Kenya. It's reducing the backlog of work, and um, it's a settlement rated 50% or more, and a lot of money is being released back to the economy. Police brutality in Kenya is kept in check. Recently, two policemen were convicted and sentenced for having um, killed an inmate. Somali, despite war between Kenya and Somali, the two, uh, because of Shabab, both countries referred their dispute to the International Court of Justice, and the dispute is right here at The Hague. And Rwanda, again, uh, on dispute resolution is Gachacha courts. I uh, have only one minute. I, I can't tell you anything more than that, but they were very, very helpful during the, the uh, this was, um, is soon after the, or during, or soon after the uh, genocide. And finally, because of time, I want to say that please note that the age of East African countries, most of them gained independence in 1962. And the prosecution is comparing them with countries that have been independent for 20 years, 40 years, 50 years. East Africa will get there. Thank you very much. Just one. Thank you. I think the show of hands uh, says it all. I want to thank both counsel uh, for their diligence and respect of time. And uh, I think it rests for the court to deliberate and uh, judgment at 7 p.m. sharp, and meanwhile, I join this session. Thank you very much. <laughs>